Things get off-centered when the focus is not kept properly fixed. Centering the focus on the proper goal keeps life moving in the right direction. As we think about the idea of being centered uh, and, and our mindfulness of being centered, considering being in a canoe, centering keeps that canoe from tipping over. I remember uh, a number of years ago uh, when a group of, of us uh, went out to, with teams and we were canoeing, and there were three of us in each of the canoes, and the water was a bit choppy uh, that day. And so we had two paddlers, one in the front, one in the back, and then one team in, in the middle. And, and the particular canoe that I was in, I was in the back. Now we might think the significance is the one in the front and the back that are doing the paddling, but actually, especially because of the choppy waters, that person that was in the center of the canoe, was play, they played a very crucial role because any time a wave hit and the canoe started to rock or tip and water might start to come in the side, that person in the middle dropped down to the bottom of the canoe and that helped center it again. And so that crucial role kept us from tipping over and kept the canoe from filling up with water. Also, centeredness is something to be mindful of when out on the highways as we, we stay in our own lane and, and traffic is able to travel safely. Though when in India we found lines on the roads didn't seem to mean uh, very much, we, we know how important it is uh, in, in this country on, on our highways to, to stay within the lines. It also provides a, a vision for a target to be hit and centering that focus, centering the focus on the bullseye. It is also of paramount significance in life's journey as we recognize the need of staying on the right path. Note Israel's reminder prior to entering the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, 32 to 33, part of that message reads this way. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. They were to keep their focus on the way of God and on the will of God, not going to the right, not going to the left, but keeping the focus there as they would journey on in their life there in the promised land. Unfortunately, they did not always keep that warning in mind. They did not always heed that instruction, and they did go off to the sides. We need to be careful ourselves that we are not easily sidetracked. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 21, there we read, Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. You know, one who doesn't have the proper understanding may be sidetracked by various things out in the world. And, oh, that looks like fun. Oh, oh, I want to get engaged in that. I want to be in, involved in, in that. And, and they may get delayed or they may be completely sidetracked from where they are going. But as, as Solomon says here, a man of understanding walks straight ahead, keeps that goal in mind, keeps the focus properly centered on the destination to which they are going. And, and we need to understand this in a spiritual sense. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 to 27, there we read, Let your eyes look directly forward, and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Don't get sidetracked. Keep the focus straight ahead. Look at the goal. Keep pressing uh, onward. You know, we need to be mindful of the path on which we are walking. And as we are walking on the path of God, we are not to detour to the left, right, or, or to the left, but keep our gaze forward. The Hebrew writer, after talking about those great heroes and heroines of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, 
then address the idea of where the focus was to be fixed. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. As we think about Jesus, Jesus did not detour from the path that he was to travel in this life. He focused on that cross and he continued journeying to that cross. And there was joy in, in knowing what would be accomplished there, though he uh, suffered agonizing pain. Uh, though it was an excruciating thing for him to go through, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And here the Hebrew writer is urging his readers to keep looking to Jesus, to fix their, their eyes on Jesus. The Greek word here that is translated uh, looking is aphorontes, aphorontes from aphorao. And it is a word that means to, to look away from one thing to see another. Apo from and harao to see, uh, to concentrate uh, the gaze uh, upon uh, something. And the Hebrew writer had been dealing with shadows, been dealing with the, the things that the law was, was pointing to, and yet their reality is in Christ, and that the sh focus needed to remain on Jesus and not those things. We need to look to Jesus and not the world. Remember uh, Peter, when he focus, his focus shifted from Jesus to the waves around him, he began to sink. He needed to keep his focus fixed on Jesus. C.S. Lewis is quoted as stating, When you keep your face toward the sun, the shadows will always fall behind you. And we need to keep our focus toward the Son of God. And leave the shadows behind us. Leave the things that are not substantive behind us. Keep our focus. Fix it squarely on, on Jesus that we can continue to walk on in him. We need to live a Christ-centered life. As Paul noted, the mystery which had been hidden for ages and generations past in Colossians chapter 1. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. This is beginning at verse 24. I, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. And now note verses 27 to 28. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of, of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. In verse 29, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. There are three things that the Paul states here. Uh, addressing the idea of Christ in you and him we proclaim and, and to present them mature in, in Christ, focusing on a, a Christ-centered life. And today I want to focus on the middle one of those, him we proclaim and uh, as we, we look at, at the idea of what is, is core to the gospel message. And then Lord willing, we'll look at the idea of Christ in you, of that, that relationship uh, that we have, the present relationship with Christ, and then Lord willing, the Sunday after that, we'll consider that maturity in Christ of, of looking ahead uh, as we focus on him. But Paul, as he says here, him we proclaim. Jesus remains central to the teaching of Paul, remains central to his message. It was not about Paul. 
It was not about the other apostles. It was about Jesus and drawing souls to Jesus and acknowledging Jesus for who he is. And as Paul was writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1 and verses 20 to 24, there he says, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. We preach Christ crucified, Paul said. That is not always understood by everyone. Some see it as folly. Some see it as ridiculous. A, a, a crucified Lord. It was something that the disciples themselves did not understand as Jesus was going through it. But it was the plan of God. It was the means of atoning for sin by giving his son as the Paschal Lamb for all time that his blood might deal adequately with our sins. Jesus must remain center to the gospel message because he is the one who has provided the good news of hope, of eternal hope, of salvation from our sins, of, of complete cleansing. It is something that I can't give you and no one else in this world can give you. It is only that which comes from Christ. And so it remained core to the gospel message of Paul. That hope was centered in, in him. And Paul continued to try to set himself aside so that Jesus would be seen and, and the message would remain focused on Jesus. And as he addressed that, that gospel message in 1 Corinthians 15, in verses 1 through 5, there we read, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. See, even in their salvation, they could lose that salvation by wandering from that hope and wandering from Christ. He went on to say, verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and, and on he, he went from, from there. Christ's death for our sins, his, his burial, his, his resurrection were all a fulfillment of the scriptures. It's what the, the, the prophets and the, the law had pointed to, the coming of Christ and the giving of himself on our behalf. Paul says his Christ, his, uh, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection are core to the good news, the gospel message. And as we recognize our entrance into Christ, into that relationship with him, we have that direct parallel of baptism, of being united with him in a burial in, in water as we die to sin and die to self, buried in that water and rising to a new life, death, burial, and resurrection into new life. Jesus died for us. He was buried, but he was raised again. And as Paul would go on here and mention those to whom he had uh, appeared to, the other uh, disciples, and, and to, uh, eat to 500 at one time, and even to himself, and in a sense Paul was saying, uh, there are people still around, you can check this out with, they saw him, they know that he had raised from the dead, as we know he had raised from the dead. And so his hope was centered in that. Centered on the events which provided for our complete forgiveness, the redemption of our souls and, and the eternal hope that is ours, the message of salvation must remain Christ-centered as he alone is able to save us. 
You know, this is very clear as, as the church was beginning to grow and, and Jesus being central to that, that message. In Acts chapter 4 and verses 11 through 12, and this is after uh, Peter and John had healed that, that lame man there by the gate beautiful and had restored his, his full strength to his legs. And the people were amazed at his ability then uh, to walk, recognizing him as that one who had sat there begging. And the disciples were brought before the Jewish council, um, and they were questioned about how it was that this one was able to, uh, to walk again. And it wasn't the apostles, it wasn't Peter and John that Peter drew the attention to, but to Jesus, as he says in, in verse 11 and 12, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus, uh, Peter there centered that salvation on Jesus. There was no other means, no other way. Though Jesus was being rejected by the Jewish council and by many, uh, Peter draws unequivocally the attention to the need of believing in Jesus. The need of being connected with him, of having a life that is centered on him as our salvation is centered in him. There is no other name, he says, under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. Jesus is our means of salvation. And as Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 5 through 6, he says, For there is one God, and there was one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Jesus came in the flesh in order to die in the flesh, to offer his flesh on the cross as a sacrifice for us. Jesus, as he's referred here as the man Christ Jesus, he gave himself in the flesh. But he was the son of God, and, and, and Paul makes it very clear, he is the only mediator between us and God. I'm not the mediator between you and God. No one else is the mediator between you and God, but Jesus is that mediator. Jesus is the one who has opened up the way for us to come into the eternal presence of God. Our salvation was also central to our Lord's purpose, to our Lord's purpose in coming, and it will also be central to his purpose in coming again. In his coming to earth in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, and here is a declaration that Jesus made in the home of, of Zacchaeus, whom he had gone to his home to, to eat with him, and other tax collectors were there, and Jesus was criticized for being amongst a group like that. But Jesus there declared, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's what he was doing in Zacchaeus' house. That day salvation came to Zacchaeus' house. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost and to give himself for us. And in Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 27 to 28, there we read, and just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. When Jesus comes again, he's not going to die again. He already took care of sin by dying on the cross once for all. But when he comes again, there will be judgment when he comes again. But he's also coming not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Those who are his, those who are prepared to go with him to that place that is prepared for them. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus is the only one that's going to be able to save us and to bring us into the Heavenly Father's eternal presence. As seeking and saving was central then to our Lord's uh, coming, may our hope continue to rest in the truth 
of the Christ-centered gospel. Christ is to be proclaimed. May we proclaim the Christ to those who need to come to know him. And may our life declare that Christ truly is the Lord of our life. And Lord willing, next week we will consider the Christ-centered life. And then, Lord willing, the Sunday after that, the Christ-centered uh, future. But let us remember what Jesus himself declared prior to his going out to the garden to pray and, and his arrest and then his, his crucifixion as he was talking with the disciples and Philip had asked a, a question and there in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That doesn't leave room for any other way. That doesn't leave room for any other access. That doesn't leave room for any other means. Jesus unequivocally declared, no one comes to the Father except through me. And if that's a lie, if Jesus was not speaking the truth, why believe him about anything? But because he himself is the truth and because he is the life, let us understand clearly and accept that there is no other access to the Father except through Him. As we continue to keep our focus fixed on Him, that we may follow into the eternity that He went to prepare for us. Jesus presently is our help for today, but He's also our hope for tomorrow. And regardless of the things that might be going on in our life today, let us keep our focus fixed on, on Jesus as the core of the good news, the core of the gospel message, knowing that regardless of what we're going through, we still have hope in him because he is able, as he was able to sufficiently deal with our sins by his blood on the cross, he is also able to bring us into the eternal glorious presence of the heavenly Father. Keep the focus fixed on Jesus and may our life proclaim truly and genuinely and sincerely that Jesus is our Lord.